So I wanted to welcome everyone. I'm Gloria Condrup, and um, I'm very happy to say that this is our final salon of the summer. Very sad, Sean. Um, but uh, of course, we, we will be back, and it's so wonderful to have what I consider an iconic Los Angeles designer, Kim Bear. Sean Adams, my wonderful co-host, the chair of graduate and undergraduate graphic design at Art Center College of Design. And very extraordinary. It has been a pleasure doing yeah, this. This has been you. fun. And uh, take it away and introduce our fabulous Thank guest. Thank you, Gloria. You're and welcome. this has been great fun. It's like Thank I you. can't imagine their co-host to do this with. It's such a great time. Good morning, America. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> And Kim, you are so sweet to do this. I can't thank you enough for taking time and joining I us. I said to Gloria yesterday, since I'm the end of the line, I think it should be like Burning Man and I should like set my studio on fl in flames at the I end. Go for it. Yeah, I think go that way. Now we, we, we were like, I said, we have to have Kim last because we really need someone to send this thing off with a bang. And, um, and then, and actually, I mean, in all seriousness, you know, I mean, I think I met you first when we were on the AIJ board together and um, you were always a person I could go to if I needed advice or I was like, you know, facing a political dilemma because you were the one human being that was always kind and compassionate and could see clearly above all of the issues and emotions. Um, and, and so that's why I said we need to end with someone who's like, like, as I said in my email to the students, like, just a remarkable human being. I mean, in addition to being a, an amazing designer, which there's a lot of amazing designers in the world, there's not a lot of amazing human beings. So um, that's why we're Thank so you. so excited that you're doing this and that you're here. And and I'm sorry. You're basically, you're just together. you're basically describing the skill sets of the oldest of six uh, personalities. <laughs> so you're just looking for an oldest child to fill the the last slot. Well, you could have been a tyrant. Uh, you know, you yeah. could have gone down that road. <laughs> well, um, I'm thrilled and thank you. And thank I think you. I'm excited that the students and our guests that are visiting us get to see some of your work. They'll be completely inspired and just your thought process. And it's, it's so, I've been so lucky to work with you on several projects and it's- Yes, we've gotten to share stuff. Such an imagine, it's, it's an amazing project process and you're so generous and, and collaborative. And, so I can't say enough. All right, well, I'll, I'll go away. I'll let, you, I'll let you take it from here. Goodbye, come back. Um, so it's no accident that the, the title of this, for whatever worth the title has about the power of design, because I really do believe in the power of design um, more now than ever. And uh, in walking through this, we'll talk about why I think that's true. Um, but I thought I would start because I think it's always interesting about hearing, uh, as you have all been talking to various people about how they came to design and how they came to their careers about like, well, what was that path? I mean, how did that happen? And I would say that um, mine was not a traditional path to being a designer. And, and I really think um, that the first part that I'll describe here is I really think of being an apprentice because the reality is I didn't go to design school. I was trained as a fine artist. I was trained as a printmaker. And so really everything I learned about design was um, self-taught and on, on the job and because of pure passion. I started out as an incredibly voracious reader from the time I was a kid. So I actually think my coming at design is that really through the lens of being a content lover of being somebody who is a big reader to this day. Um, it's it's the, my favorite way to spend time. And so from early on, um, even as a 15 and 16 year old, I was really fascinated by the relationship of text and image and what happened with that. And you know, I learned to drive so that I could drive to UCLA to take a lettering class. I was always fascinated by lettering forms, uh, which included a real passion about um, letterpress printing from the very beginning and, and making artist books. Um, in addition to thinking about sort of the Western canon of uh, lettering and books, I was also from a really young age, all through high school, especially because I was doing a, a lot of silk screening. I was, I was constantly silk screening on the family dining room table, um, which I don't even want to think about the fumes and the long-term ramifications of that. But 
um, I was always interested in the eclectic sort of world beat of letter forms. And, um, you know, interestingly, I think I always saw things through a very high contrast flat lens, which obviously made me sort of primed for thinking about graphic design. So, um, you know, whether you're thinking about Islamic calligraphy or um, uh, the kind of motifs that were in Africa or um, this art coming out of um, India, very, very, very ancient. So again, text and image in all the forms that it, that it came. And then when I got to college, um, again, as a printmaker, um, I was really attracted to what was, had been happening in the 50s and 60s in terms of abstract expressionism. So whether it was Franz Klein, which is this slide and the next two slides. Um, obviously, again, my eye sees in black and white, my eye sees um, really bold motifs. Again, I think um, the eye of a graphic designer, even though I didn't necessarily know that. Um, th those were Robert Motherwell's. This is Ellsworth Kelly, who used um, incredible bold shapes as well as these incredibly beautiful line drawings that he did as a series. So all through college, I was really looking at fine art again, another Ellsworth Kelly. And then not chronologically in terms of how the world worked, but chronologically for me, thinking about some of these people like Robert Motherwell, who also worked a lot in collage as I did. And, you know, again, this um, bringing in typographic elements, which was something I resonated with from the very beginning. And that sort of, again, turned me on to being really, really interested, whether it's uh, uh, Schwitters, which you're seeing these pieces, the Dadaists um, that were playing with type, um, playing is a misnomer here because they were deadly serious about it, but um, it's a really playful approach. So whether looking at the work of Dadaists or the next slide, um, thinking about um, somebody like El Lozitsky, and I can't, must have gone through like a whole Russian period because here's El Lozitsky, and if we go to the next slide, um, Maholy Naj, and thinking about people like Maievich. Again, really this intense, um, bold work and then later in the, in the 60s, thinking about what came out of Swiss um, typography and something that really spoke to me. Um, and again, very high contrast, but a really intense uh, understanding about hierarchy and thinking about hierarchy and with an incredible um, simple um, toolkit, how simply could you actually communicate um, the organization of information was obviously something I resonated with before I even knew um, how to have the language for it. Um, I thought it would be interesting to end this section with this piece from uh, the Vignelles, which was uh, in the 80s. So again, it's clearly really informed by all the work that this, um, the Swiss school did, uh, the, especially coming out of the Bauhaus. But this is in the 1980s, and this is about um, the time that I got to New York. And I had been luckily able to get various design. I you know, put myself through school um, working um, in design studios. And then after design, after a couple of years, decided it was really imperative that I go to New York. And what was really interesting is that um, big corporations at the time, globally, were starting to turn to graphic designers um, who had been trained as uh, um, in the sort of sensibility that is represented here by this Vignelli piece uh, about using um, the skills of graphic designers to, to communicate um, with their various audiences. So uh, corporations started hiring graphic designers to do their annual reports, for instance, which were really important documents at the time. This was way pre-web. Um, and corporations would print 400,000 copies of these um, really quite elaborate, beautiful reports um, to communicate with their investors. And graphic designers had an incredible um, kind of run of helping with these kinds of documents where you got to hire most incredible photographers, most incredible illustrators from all over the world to do these reports. And that's really where I was kind of uh, cut my teeth about doing that kind of work. So if we go into the next section, I came out of New York and came back to Los Angeles with no intention of starting a design firm, but started getting projects and really came to quickly realize that most of my 
um, work with clients, in addition to bringing all the design sensibilities, was helping them solve problems. So coming out of that New York world where, you know, you would literally be sitting in the room with the CEO of, um, you know, a Fortune 500 company, you began to realize that designers had a sort of set of superpowers if they were willing to, to employ them to help people think about communicating strategy. So that really became most of my life, I would say over the last certainly couple of decades. So if we think about problem solving, I think this quote, which I um, came out of a conversation I had with a, a really interesting woman, Cynthia Geyer, who has worked in education. She's worked running a museum. She has worked running a national, uh, uh, international NGO. And she said something to me that I found incredible. She said, after working across all those different sectors, that what she realized after all those the years of doing that work, that every project she was involved with finally got off the ground once designers came to the table. And I thought it was the best description of that, again, the superpowers of designers, about how designers can make a difference, the power of graphic design. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I think those superpowers are and why they can be helpful in, um, in a lot of different situations. So we use this slide to, to talk about our work. Um, and it, we really use it to say, because a lot of people have a very particular way they think about graphic design and they think about it sometimes like decorating a page, they think about it as um, the various kinds of tools, whether it's a website or a logo, you know, people, I'm sure everybody hears this as anybody on this phone call, this, oh, graphic design, oh, what do you design? Oh, you do logos or you do. And so we really use this wheel to say, well, first of all, every project that we work on always begins with research, really deep um, audience research, because the first question we ask uh, anybody we're working with is, who are your audiences? Why do they matter to you and what matters to them? And that work that does not start with that um, will always be um, half as successful as it could be if it really starts with, again, the audience in mind. So we do deep research to start every project, obviously strategy, and then, you know, lots of different kinds of implementation, whether that's online or in environments. And I'm going to show you projects that kind of run the gamut of that. So, you know, again, people think about designing as, as a visual language, and it certainly is that. But what we find is that that visual language is in service of, um, you know, kind of complex uh, problems. And that what designers are really doing and how they're employing those um, skill sets is through all of these other things that are required for any really good project and really complicated projects to, um, to again, take off. And that's designers have the ability to convene groups and to facilitate really often difficult and kind of thorny conversations. Designers have an incredible ability to help clients and, and colleagues map a process, um, and I'll show examples of that, to explore tone of voice. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how we also get involved with writing on almost every project we do. The ability to prototype, and you see this um, that's been talked a lot in the last 10 years about design thinking, that prototyping is critical to the success of every project, and, and no one does that better really than um, designers, whether they're graphic designers or industrial designers. Testing, which comes out of uh, as an end result of prototyping and refining. And so again, those re refer back to a lot of the things that are intrinsic uh, in design thinking, but they're things that designers can do in a very particular way that other people in the room are not trained to do or necessarily oriented to do. If you click on this, I just want to, before we click on it, what I wanted to do, I, I I created this little two minute video for uh, an AIJ presentation years ago. And what I it got uh, sort of fostered because a friend of mine said that all of the, the pictures on his phone were of food. And I realized all the pictures on my phone are of diagrams. And that's because if you really think about it, the ability to diagram, and I love this quote from Charles Eames about the best design is a diagram of the problem. It's this ability to start very loosely and start really thinking about core messages and, and hierarchies.
So again, you'll see some of these projects that got just sort of uh, flashed up there on the screen. We'll walk through a couple of them. But you know, those drawings, and especially you know, now that we're um, all working remotely, I'm literally sharing those kinds of drawings all day long with not only the people on the KBGA team, but the extended teams we're working with. And they almost, every project almost uh, always begins with at least one or if not 20 of those kinds of drawings. And I thought I'd stop for just a second and um, just for a minute say, you know, these are the kinds of clients that we've been working with. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that's even shifted over the years. But it's a, a a range and especially in the last 10 years, um, working mostly with cultural organizations. So we'll talk about how that came to be. The thing that I still love the most about design and why I think I will never be able to stop designing actually is because it's, well, it's actually the, the most fun thing I can think of doing and it's really fun uh, only and because of um, getting to work with incredibly smart, passionate, um, interesting people. And it's really the kinds of projects we do require these kinds of really complicated and elaborate collaborations, whether it's with writers, filmmakers, researchers, photographers, programmers. Um, every project brings all these people to the table and um, it's what makes it really uh, worthwhile. What I thought I'd do is again, alluding back to the starting, the work that started when I was in New York and then really the first, I would say half of KBDA is problem solving for commerce. So organizations that were um, companies for the most part, and we can just walk through this quickly. So I won't say a lot about each project. Um, you can see that they're kind of captioned in the corner. So whether we're doing brand brochures for financial services company, and again, this alludes back to this ability to work with incredible illustrators to try and push the envelope a little bit about um, how uh, companies communicate. And one thing I love about illustration, a great photography too, but especially illustration, is to be able to get across very, um, complex and often abstract concepts. This is a project for Fox River Paper Company. It was actually directed to designers getting to work with an incredible um, photographer named Eric Tucker on the nature of color. And it was not only the images are, uh, are eye attracting and that's what is so powerful about imagery, but the content actually had a whole technical part to it. Um, Mace Rich is a big, one of the biggest retail uh, companies in, in the country. Um, using the sort of uh, visual vocabulary of uh, fashion magazines to again tell this corporate uh, story. It's done by um, Alison Bloss in, in, on the team. Again, great photography. Um, often we got brought to the table by companies that had very lower, uh, smaller profiles and they wanted us to put them on the map. So a company like Magid, uh, which targeted uh, again, media companies, and we're talking about um, millennials changing business as, as business had been known previous. And so we came to the table with all the photo concepts, with the writer, with the photographer. And again, you know, I'm trained as a information designer. My passion is about how to get people to read because it's, it's really hard. Uh, with every passing day, harder to get people to read because they're overwhelmed. MetWest, which is another fun financial services company, again, trying to come up with a, a brand tone for them that would stand out in the marketplace, which was pretty, in the past, uh, known for being very, well, boring is the best way I can say it. So coming up, in fact, with a way of how do you even create a brand library of photography that conveys what people, how people are working, in a way that catches people's attention. And Nike, I don't need to explain, we were very lucky to work with them for several years, including creating uh, websites. And uh, the next slide uh, you're gonna see is actually, uh, was the finished storyboard for a video that we did uh, for their um, investment uh, website. And again, hiring a writer, working with photographers. And about, um, I would say about a dozen years ago, I. I felt just personally, and I think the people on the team were really craving 
putting design to work and that problem solving that designers are able to do for institutions we were really passionate about. And so that really led us to doing more and more work for whether it was museums or other nonprofits um, where we felt like we could make a difference. And so here we are in the problem solving for culture. And again, it's many of the same kinds of skill sets, but for different kinds of uh, clients. So just gonna show again, um, many of you are familiar with KCRW, which is, uh, it was interesting. What we really tried to do here working with a, a fantastic writer is really convey that KCRW was um, so much more than a radio station. And it really was, you know, a, a, a cultural force at that point. It was both addressing the future of public media. It was um, a, a cultural force in Los Angeles. And then using photographs from their incredible library of all of these incredible luminaries that have um, spoken or performed in the KCRW basement at the time, now they have, luckily. This piece was about helping them raise the money for their new uh, headquarters. So whether it was, again, great quotes and portraits or creating infographics that would help convey how much um, the, the station had changed over time, using renderings from the really great architects they were working with. It was all about helping paint a vision for what that organization could be if, if um, philanthropists would step up and, and help support the vision. LA Phil um, was in Disney Hall, uh, but they, you know, they were dealing with some challenges that uh, traditional music had in terms of getting new audiences. And so one of the things we were able to help them do was think about, again, tone of voice for the graphics, but also using information design to help people find the information they needed as quickly as possible to make decisions. One of the things I'm really fascinated about is just cognition and how people take information in. And if they get people get too confused or overwhelmed, their natural inclination is to set it down and then you don't have engagement. So I'm really interested in how graphic design can help um, help people with that engagement. Um, this is a project for RAND, which is a global think tank, one of, the, one of the most respected think tanks in the world. This is a recent project we did for them. Again, getting to work with an incredible uh, illustrator from the UK to create um, sort of eye-catching illustrations that would help convey these abstract concepts that they needed to convey. And you know, it goes from print to a whole um, electronic campaign and, and website. Descanso Gardens, um, many, I hope all of you have gotten to go to Descanso Gardens. It's one of um, LA's kind of secret wonders. It's tucked in the, in the hills and mountains, uh, I would say behind uh, Pasadena. It's not very far from Art Center at all. Um, they have, acres and acres of gardens, but it was very, very hard for people to find. You're seeing here a piece we did for them in their courtyard that would orient people to what was available. Um, the piece on the right was their existing map, and the map actually was confusing. People were always lost. The people would come and not be able to find what they needed or get uh, exhausted trying to find it. So what we did was actually, and I found an incredible map maker who lives in uh, Bozeman, Montana, but literally spends his life making maps of ski resorts. And I said, if this guy can figure out how to convey the terrain of a ski resort so somebody doesn't kill themselves on a black diamond slope, this guy can help us figure out how to convey, how to help people explore this very tucked in valley um, and these gardens. And so we worked with um, everyone at Descanso for about, I would say, six to eight months, mapping with GPS coordinates and photographs and all kinds of things, um, how to help convey it both visually and then um, uh, with other tools. That culminated also in a whole wayfinding and what they call in the museum world an interpretive system, which means as people went from the camellia forest or they went to the rose garden or they went to the oak woodland, they could not only know where they were, they could have a sense of context for the whole garden, but also know what was, what was really interesting about the place they were standing. And then the wayfinding on the right, 
not only tells them where they are and where they could go if they move straight or they to make a left, but tells them how far it will take to the get to the next place and how steep it might be in case they're they're pushing a wheelchair or a, um, a baby stroller. So that kind of way, find, that kind of again information design in a in a location. Um, getting to work with the Hammer Museum, which is just such a stellar um, again place in Los Angeles, place and cultural force. Getting to help them think through how to best project their vision for the future of the Hammer. They're now in the process of uh, redoing, I think, up, probably up to about fifty percent of their um, public spaces. And so this was the um, the communication tool to help again raise money for that renovation. Again, whether it's using photography, renderings, information graphics to again help people flip through but get the big ideas. So I thought I'd um, just quickly go through an in-depth case study about the Natural History Museum. This is a place Sean and I got to overlap um, and do work at the same time for, uh, for the museum. And we have long-term relationships with a lot of our clients, but this may be one of the longest. We started working with them in 2006. We've done so many projects for them over the years. Um, I'm gonna focus on just a few. This first section about the branding and showing some before and afters, which of course graphic designers love before and afters, and then focusing on an exhibit design project. So if we go through the first, I have to say, I would be remiss to confess that this is a special, they are sort of a special child for um, the studio. Everybody um, has had an incredible experience growing with them. Um, when we got there in 2006, some of the challenges were that the attendance was down, there were fundraising hurdles. It just wasn't on people's radar in Los Angeles. I can't tell you the number of people would say, LA has a natural history museum. I go to the New York one all the time. I didn't even know LA had one, which is crazy because it was actually one of the first museums started in Los Angeles. I think actually the first in, um, what was it? 1913. Um, and overall, it was just perceived as subpar. So that, in their minds, what they hired KBJ to was to do come in and design a logo and that that would somehow solve everything and make everything better. But of course, we knew that actually was not going to be what they needed. So I'm going to show you a couple of before. This is what it was like when we got there. So this was their existing um, logo. This was their existing membership campaign. These were some existing uh, posters that would be sort of around the campus as you walked around. They had a website that was about 6,000 pages. And you know, when we did a whole analysis um, and deep dive into the uh, navigation system, what we found was that there were places that people had put up pages and you couldn't even get to them from anywhere else. It was basically, we had to take it down and, and start over from scratch. But this is the look, sort of the look of it. And then this was, this is one of the saddest pictures I've ever seen in my life. I happened to take it, but it was such a sad moment where this is what some of the um, environmental graphics looked like at the museum when we got there. Last but not least, this is what their lobby looked like, which I think the, the mode at the time was just keep adding signs. Maybe if we're not happy with the way it looks, we'll just add another one and make it better. But it was really, um, it was not only really bad for visitors, but it looked like a mess. Okay, so again, with a deep dive about research and doing a lot of audience research and a lot of work with the staff around strategic planning, um, we really convinced them that all the branding needed to be completely integrated into their strategic plans. And that out of that also, they needed to develop a, a whole uh, different approach to their online presence because, you know, even in 2006, um, a website was the front door. Um, all rebranded marketing plus in gallery execution and looking at their public spaces. You know, with, if you're working with any nonprofit, this is true for for profit companies too, but certainly with nonprofits, you know, you're really having to create a roadmap for them because you can create an incredible vision for them of what's possible, but the reality is it's all going to be um, have to be factored by their budgets. 
And so what we really did was map a plan for them that was going to go through many different budget cycles so that they could prioritize and figure out a sequence that would make sense. So this is, these are the kinds of documents, planning documents we work with. So developing consensus, the, um, you know, I, I have personally kept three, the 3M company in business with a number of post-its we use because of working, um, doing really, really in-depth workshops, many, often for many, many days. And I'm sure everybody on this call is now doing more and more of that with clients. But even on the right side where we brought together teams of people and created um, workshops where we tried to have it feel as playful as possible because People have to spend too much of their lives in meetings and they get to the table and they don't feel necessarily inspired. And so we try and have those meetings be as interactive and use all the tools of design to have it feel um, like a place they want to be, like a place they want to spend time. Um, because the output you get, of course, is, is the quality is way better. So from the very beginning, what we had to do was make, put a sort of stake in the ground that we could really show the museum that by really orienting their, their tone of voice, they could make a difference in how people perceive them. So instead of you know, everything looking like beige on beige on brown on beige on beige on brown, because Natural History Museum, everything comes out of the dirt. So everything at the time just was in shades of brown, was really to think about being much bolder um, both in language and visually, but also to ultimately say what they are is the real thing, that you can go research uh, sharks at the National Geographic website, but the reality is you can see a shark at the Natural History Museum. So even developing this tagline about stop by, get real, um, the whole idea was they have the real thing there. And what they were really trying to do is um, say that they wanted to be a cultural destination that people could just stop by and have it be a neighborhood experience. One of the things, you know, again, so many people on this call get involved with branding. And one of the things we find working um, on complex branding um, projects with complex organizations is you know, it's, it is so not an in and out uh, uh, situation because you need to set up systems where, again, everyone in the organization can rally around it, that long after you as a design firm are gone, that it, it is still um, stable and that it's sustainable. So the kinds of documentation that you create, this was taking a page um, from a, a project that Rem Koolhaas did at Harvard, which, which was, you know, was Harvard, not Harvard, which was really getting them, as they were thinking about building a new building, to think about using analogies for getting to the, the core personality of the institution. So we did this with um, NHM. And so NHM, yes, Andy Goldsworthy, because he's an incredible artist that uses natural materials, Maybe not John McCracken, because while an incredible artist, the sort of hard edge engineered surfaces was not actually part of the tone that would make sense for NHM. So again, using analogies, because you're not always working with designers, you're working with you know, uh, the finance department and the scientists to be able to get a sense of, again, a tonality that's gonna be able to, to withstand time. I'll just go quickly through this, you know, various kinds of um, ways of being able to document things for ongoing implementation. This is all brand guidelines. Brand guidelines are, are uh, you know, <laughs> mostly people think of them as a set of rules. We try and think of them as a, as a document that inspires people to want to be part of the brand solutions. Again, starting to look at um, materials that came out of it. So suite of logos, brand new up, up from the ground uh, website. All new um, visitor guides. New membership materials. Again, all based on the, uh, what the museum has in its collections, helping them build support with fundraising and redoing their historic lobby uh, and built in uh, screens and um, trying to simplify it and really working with visitor flow and all of that. Um, 
you know, they really saw results, some dramatically right away and some over time, but, you know, various metrics about fundraising and attendance and getting sponsorships and media attention. So all of those tools, and again, this was a huge amount of work with uh, us and everybody at the museum from top to bottom is really responsible for this and um, the ongoing work that the inter internal teams at NHM do are incredible. So if we keep going, I thought I'd do, um, I'll just very quickly do um, a case study about exhibit development. And this is something that is really relatively new for us over the last 10 years, but it's become a passion because it's really where information design meets branding meets uh, um, experience design. I'll do this quickly, but when we start talking about the, some of that, um, those superpowers I was talking about at the very beginning, this was coming to the table often with 30 people in a room with all of these scientists and educators and there were, I mean, we were in a trailer, honestly, for about a year um, with these planning meetings. And frankly, we ended up taking the lead of trying to facilitate having people under, you know, come to an agreement about what this exhibit was going to be about, which was uh, the idea of nature in Los Angeles, urban nature as being a phenomenon. So again, always starting with these crazy diagrams. Um, but then starting to use wireframing, which many of you on this call, um, I'm sure do around uh, online experiences, we found wireframing to be an incredible, powerful tool um, with almost everything we do because it gets, again, consensus about what are the key ideas and what are the relationships of um, information. Again, a tool that I'm sure almost everyone on this call uses about mood boards, but when you're talking to non-designers, you're talking to ornithologists and paleontologists and um, all kinds of people in the museum that did not speak design, being able to give visceral um, tools that people can operate almost from a gut level um, and come to consensus is really helpful. Again, starting to do visual vocabulary studies so that people could come to agreement before we went too far down the path. Again, thinking about how different elements would come to play so we could get sign off before we kept going. Working with the architects on 3D reference, the idea of this exhibit was it was gonna feel like a, like a kitchen, like sitting at a kitchen counter or working at a kitchen counter with a family would feel that people could sit, stand, move around. And so the, the point was how our graphics would actually fit into that uh, kinetic experience. User testing, I could have a whole hour long conversation about my passion about user testing because it's amazing as designers, we think we know how something's going to be perceived, but there is nothing like doing a couple of different versions and then standing in the lobby at the museum and getting to uh, talk with visitors and get them to give you their feedback in, in these very funky mock-ups, you know, where it's just black and white but you're able to get that feedback before you go too far and, and actually then share it with the client because you can, you can give quantifiable um, research results about what works and what doesn't work. Which was very helpful when talking to scientists who didn't really care about design much, but when we could prove to them that actually graphics could make a difference in terms of how people retain the, the information uh, it was really, really gave us a lot more um, credibility. Shared principles document, we didn't call it brand guidelines because we were working again with um, everybody from architects to uh, uh, animal care people, to the people building the tanks, to the people who were um, doing the um, interactive, uh, the on-screen interactive. So, this is just about three slides of showing how this let our design language be then integrated into everybody else's work that was working on the project. You're seeing the, the tank of the frogs, um, showing all the design motifs that would get woven through the exhibit. You know what, it's 146. Sean, should I maybe stop because I, yeah, I think people probably, I mean, I know that we've got a bunch of questions and I yeah, want to stop. Time, you know, to I, the one thing I'll say this last section, which we don't need to do was actually, I had the incredible um, luxury and gift of getting to bring a whole bunch of people who are art center 
illustration teachers to the table where they helped us create a lot of the exhibits because we really mm -hmm. used a sort of graphic novel approach. So whether that was Brian Ray or um, Mark Todd, uh, Anne Field, all those people we got to con into being involved with this project. So, but you guys can see that some other time, but I want to make sure we leave time for questions. So Sean, you guide this part of it. Well, I think the, when, whenever the Natural History Museum opens up again, everyone really yeah. needs to go down and look at the Nature Lab. It's a remarkable exhibition. You'll get to see snakes. You get to see snakes. But so, yeah, I mean, I love the fact that you made it accessible to children, but not in a stupid way with like backwards S's. You made it like, touch this thing, see this thing. This is you in relationship with these things. And like you said, you're not dealing with designers or creative people. You're dealing with people that are scientists and are like, well, just give them like four paragraphs of information and then they'll know everything they need to know about that squirrel. That's and exactly right. Somehow you have to convince them that no one really wants to read that much. And um, that's a political, um, that's difficult politically and you're, you're so good at that. Well, that's where the testing is really helpful because you can literally show. I, I got to the point where I could literally know that if the introductory paragraph was longer than four lines, I would, we would lose 50% of the audience. So when you can start to quantify that, you can really start to make a difference. And yeah. have, they, have they asked you about doing anything online um, exhibitions or to do videos to take the exhibition online? To oh, well, the, luckily they have an incredible, they have an incredible department mm -hmm. um, now in-house. So all, in, and luckily we still get to collaborate with them. Um, so they have done a fantastic job of that and they've yet launched a new website for the whole museum that does a, a really great job with interactives. Yeah, because it's, it's gotten to the point where most museums, and I know even at Art Center, Sean, you know that we have to somehow still engage the public that museums still exist. And, um, you know, museums have become very controversial lately. Um, you know, the concept of what museums are. You know, well, you could argue that they came out of colonial, a colonial yeah. state of mind, so in a point of view, but that's a, that, that is a whole deep conversation. To but this, had. what's, what's really interesting about Natural History Museum, and I think a lot of the museums, and this is what you really understand, it's about education. Yeah. I mean, when you look at this, it's just, it's so beautiful, Kim. I mean, the way the well, typography we works. Now, how did you, what made you choose um, Kivit and Fala. Well, <laughs> Kivit, you know I'm going to ask you a type question. Uh, well, yeah, I'm happy to, as the people in my studio know, I could look at type specimens all day long mm -hmm. and just be completely happy about it. Um, I could go on and on about Kivit. We probably looked at 30 sans serif typefaces. We looked mm -hmm. at them small, we looked at them large, we looked at them you know, when you were setting, you know, large blocks of copy, which often the museum has to do because of mm -hmm. white papers or even right. exhibits. Um, and it, it was both, it was clean, it was friendly, it was, it felt evergreen, it felt like they could have it for a long years. time. Right. And, and not and, to make a plug for Art Center, but it was designed by an Art Center graduate. I and did not know that. Mike yeah. Abink and Kivit was initially started when he was a student of <gasps> Leah Hoffman's. Okay, Milken. we did not plan this. Yes, this I'm, I know. We didn't plan this, everyone. But when I saw Kivit, he just, that was the first typeface I believe he designed under her okay, tutelage. Well, I, I could go on and on, but the reality is um, it has served them well yeah. and um, they're still using it and I'm still, I still love it. And I think this is a great lesson for those who are students in the audience. You have to think of the longevity of the project. You know, yes, you might be able to have you know, variants and types and decorative types, right, Sean, and do this and that, but when you talk about the core of an identity of an institution, you have to have a base that supports interjections of fun. So you can have, like, you, like, you, like, like what you've done in your exhibit designs, Kim, it's so beautifully playful because you have this underlying foundation mm -hmm. that supports all of the play that you can then throw into it. 
Well, and, and I say to and I say to clients because you know most people are not type nerds the way that probably everybody on this call is. Um, but I say to them, it's actually probably the least expensive thing they can do to make a brand statement because while people may not think that they recognize a typeface, the reality is not just the, those of us on this call, you start to learn, you know, I, I know LACMA's typeface, thanks to mm -hmm. Lorraine and her team. And, you know, you, you know an institution by their tone of voice in their type. Mm -hmm. And relatively, it's one of the least expensive things you can do to get consistency. And, and one of the, I agree, it's, it's inexpensive and and it's and it definitely can become ownable own, mm -hmm. ownable by by the institution someone asked a question and i think you can answer this if you also design the exhibition space i think with the museum you have to work around the building itself oh well that's that is see if we had longer i could talk to you about the crazy huge elevator shaft that was in the so that nature lab was actually in a basement that was so sad and scary it had no windows it was totally black when we walked in and it was one of the scariest spaces i've ever seen and it literally had a huge probably 20 by 20 square elevator shaft in the middle of it so that's one of the actually the crazy um things you have to do in exhibit design, and it's both horrifying and also kind of, um, if you're into puzzles of any kind, you have to take what the givens are, and then you have to make hay of it. So, you know, having Brian Ray do a, an incredible, come in and paint a mural on one side of it to explain the water shortage in California, you know, that, what can I say? So, yes, you just yeah. have to... It's very rare. Sometimes you get to work with a, a white box, but it's right. but in, in an institution that's a hundred years old, that that white box is not happening. No, mm -hmm. I, I asked one of the things that when you were talking about you know just your process working with cultural institutions or or you know even you know just um, Fortune five hundred companies, this idea that as a designer your job is to go in and sort of diagnose the issues and the problems and then work with them and that might be workshops that means. I, what would you say to people that are that would would come back to you and, and say, well, no, our job is to design the logo. What do you mean that you're not a marketing person? Well, and, you know, this goes back to why I titled it The Power of Design. I, it, it's a choice. And the reality is there are lots of designers who, who look at what we do and go, that is insane. You are in way too many meetings and you have to do way too many memos. And, and I just wanna, I wanna be in my studio and I wanna design a logo at two in the morning. And that is so, I mean, you know, you gotta, you gotta pick your lane and you gotta, I think that's why I showed um, the influences for me in the beginning and the fact that I started out as a reader. I, I, start, I came to design a very particular way. I, I, so, for me to feel like I can take something very complex and help people figure out a way to connect to audiences and get audiences to connect to that content is so rewarding. And to feel like I can help organizations or institutions that I feel very, very strongly about thrive, that's worth everything to me. But it's not everybody's cup of tea. I mean, there are some people who are like, forget it. I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. No, but I, pick your, I think pick your, pick you're your poison. problems. I mean, you get in and you actually make a difference as opposed to just sort of putting some icing on something. And I mean, that's, that's an amazing, but at the same time, that takes enormous amounts of skills with diplomacy and the ability to work with others. Um, and I think, all, and I, you know, one of the tenets of your success is your, your, your gentle demeanor. It's mm -hmm. so non-threatening that they will work. With are you, you are you awesome. telling me that being four eleven is part of the is, was part of the uh, advantage? Be careful, John. Awesome. Be careful, awesome. what he's. No, I. As opposed to like you know, to if you walk in, and you're like, this is the way it's going to be, and I know what's right, and I'm a designer. That just shuts people off. They're like, no, leave me alone. But you're so good. At, like, you tell me what you think. You you explain. To me. I think it's. I think honestly, it is. 
a lot about patience because there are times where you just really truly want to throw yourself off of a tall building. But, you know, there, again, when the stakes are high, if you're talking about making big changes, big changes to organizations, you know, it, guess what? There are people involved. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Turns well, out it's much easier to just, it's much easier to design if there aren't other people involved, but there you are. Right. Yeah, Bill, Bill always said, bigger clients, bigger problems. That's just yeah. so and, and, and again, I think, Kim, you really demonstrated that it's a process, that you have to have this process where you're taken through this problem, you get feedback, you give yeah. feedback, yeah. you might have to change. The client hopefully will understand your expertise, but it's a, it's a process. It's, it's a process that is shared between you and the client and the audience. And I think I'm glad you mentioned that you have people actually say, you know, will this work? You know, does yes. it, will do I get work? the emotional response from, you know, the work that I'm doing? And I think yes. today what you want and, and what you prove for the museum is people now own the museum. The people in Los Angeles feel right they right. have a museum, for instance, right. whether it's, right. you know, the Natural History Museum or RAND. I mean, that is the ultimate success of any right. designer in creating of a brand is that the audience then becomes part of the ownership. A hundred percent. And I think that's what this, you know, if students are listening or young designers are listening, you have to understand that is the pinnacle of success, that you can let it go and it yeah. kind of have, it has a life of its own and a breath of its own. So, yeah. um, so I think we have to um, end. Unfortunately, everyone has. Is it time to is it time to burn down my studio? It's in time the to burn your moment? studio down. But okay. I just wanted to say thank you, Kim. Thank you. I love to end on a Los Angeles note, and we cannot wait until we can enjoy our city again fully. Yes. Thank you, yes. Sean. But I also really, really, really want to give a wonderful shout out to Isabel Zaragoza yeah. Yeah. and Clifford Pun. These yeah. Clifford is yeah. the senior coordinator for the HMCT. Isabel is the coordinator for graphic design. Without those two and without Susan Malmstrom, my director, we would have none of this, Sean, yes. right? We would have no one to show up. I'd be like what? we wouldn't or yeah. to resolve everything. So I want to thank everyone. Thank yeah. you, Kim. Yeah. Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. On your book. Oh, yeah. You have a book, Kim? Mm -hmm. Plug it. I have a, well, I, I did a book about information design in 2009. Because I actually assigned that as a textbook. Oh. Great. So, I'm surprised you don't have it up in the background, just like all well, the political people do. You know, do you watch well, the is, news now? And here's my book on the presidency and my book on this. Well, you well, should have had the book right up there. A, and there's a new edition that's supposed to come out, but of course has been uh, delayed because of COVID, like everything else in our lives. But yeah. Thank you, Kim. Thank, Thank you, Sean. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye, and, uh, guys. Bye, and we'll, guys. And we'll see you in a few weeks once we, you know, start up again in September. Thanks, Gloria. It's been a pleasure. Bye, guys.